Excuse I. <laughs> Hey! 
of the varsity at the taxpayer's expense, they ought to have something to show for it. <laughs> but you know they have such a difficult task when you come to analyse it. They're because they have to build something that is beautiful and at the same time permanent. <laughs> Had a little trouble in Melbourne in that respect recently. <laughs> Architects are ruled by fashion just the same as we are. <laughs> Even the life, I'm no clothes horse. <laughs> but I like to be clean and tasteful. <laughs> as a matter of fact, <laughs> see this costume I'm wearing now? <laughs> I wore it in London. I wore it in Rome, in New York, in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Dublin, Edinburgh, Athens, and quite a few heads turned. <laughs> they can't teach us a thing over there, I'm telling you. I was talking about architecture. <laughs> the architects are the slaves of fashion, the same as we ladies are. But I noticed new buildings around Sydney that certainly weren't here when I was here before, not so many moons ago. <laughs> buildings like Qantas building or the Chevron Hilton building up in McLee Street there. <laughs> you know the chappy who designed that hasn't got anything to worry about whatsoever. That style will come back. <laughs> of course it will. Of course it will. navy blue double breasted isn't it? <laughs> and you know new shops all new amenities and facilities you've got in sydney as a matter of fact the other day i was having my lunch in the woolworths gourmet <laughs> they they do have a lovely hot suggestion <laughs> Cutlets on glaze. <laughs> Lovely, really. What'll they think of next? <laughs> and I was sitting there, you know, and I was thinking to myself. I thought, well, look, there is a fundamental difference between Melbourne and Sydney. There's no two ways about it, despite the fact, you know, that we in Australia have come of age. <laughs> And all the wonderful cultural renaissances we're always having over here, you know. <laughs> Despite this, to me, there is still this difference between Melbourne and Sydney. Melbourne, just to me, <laughs> is more... <laughs> and Melbourne's more... <laughs> More conservative. <laughs> More conservative, whereas Sydney, uh, to me, <laughs> that's to me. Sydney, to me, is more <laughs> cosmopolitan. <laughs> just my idea, you won't have heard that view expressed before, it's just my own. My own. By cosmopolitan, I mean you've got newspapers on a Sunday. <laughs> and of course, you've got your wonderful opera house up here, and down in Melbourne, we have our cultural centre to look forward to. <laughs> you know, I think fundamentally, we're just a big bunch of kiddies, aren't we? We've always got to have something round the corner to look forward to. <laughs> and how lovely for the powers that be to have arranged for us to have these two wonderful things to look forward to <laughs> for such a long time. <laughs> Thank you very Marvelous. Still, show business aside, I really would like to speak <laughs> to about my own family because we're a very closely knit, very wonderful, very happy family. It was marvelous to get back to my husband, Norm. <laughs> oh, dear, just the same, of course. It was such a pity he couldn't have come on the trip with me, but there it was. You see, we'd sold this block of land. 
the Melbourne suburb of Sunshine. <laughs> uh, to make it possible and it, you know it only seems yesterday that Norm and I were going through all the pros and cons finance wise on the kitchen table there on the dining room table <laughs> and quite soon you know after adding up a few facts and figures Norm realised that one of us would have to make a big sacrifice <laughs> Anyway, next day I went down to get my ticket. He's done very nicely for himself, you know. He's got himself one of these wonderful square line Holdens, you know. Aren't they marvellous cars? Well, it's more a conveyance, really. <laughs> He's got himself this... I think General Motors are absolutely marvellous, don't you? I think they're gorgeous. <laughs> I mean, letting us call it Australia's own car, <laughs> don't you? <laughs> to do that. <laughs> Such a wonderful gesture. Don't you think? <laughs> At any rate, he's as happy as a sand boy there with his new toy. <laughs> and, of course, my married daughter Val May is as absolutely lovely as ever. She's living out, you know, a little one on the way too, I think I can announce. <laughs> oh, I don't know how I'm going to feel. I'm going to be a grandmother for the first time. <laughs> Still, I suppose I'll get used to it. <laughs> oh, I'm mad. <laughs> She's living out in Hyatt, which is a beautiful dress circle suburb of Melbourne. <laughs> and of course, there's my little Kenny, you know. Oh, they're shooting up. Have to put a brick on his head. <laughs> Quite firmly from time to time. <laughs> You know, he's got a few little spots and blemishes, but nothing that a smear of Rexona ointment won't fix up. <laughs> and, of course, Sport Mad is always rushing off with Norm to the semis, to have the semi-finals of the football in Melbourne. They queue up for their tickets, you know. I said to Norm, you can have a drink at home. <laughs> building <laughs> and here I am up in Sydney primarily uh, to uh, see a little of my son Brucey wonderful boy and a very very good son to his mother <laughs> he of course was married I know many of you were at the service at Harley Trinity he married when oh, it would have been March 59, quite a while ago, quite a while ago now. He married Joylene. <laughs> and her sister Shirlene made such a beautiful bridesmaid, didn't she? You know, in that apricot organza. <laughs> With just a touch of oyster. <laughs> At any rate, Joylene and I, because I went straight off on the trip, as you know, after that, Joylene and I hadn't really had a chance to get to know each other very well. <laughs> However, now I'm up here with them. She seems to me to be a very, very sweet little person. <laughs> <laughs> well, Bruce is happy anyway, and that's the main thing, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. She comes from a very, very comfortable family. They gave her everything, though her mother has never enjoyed good health. It's only going to show that it won't buy you everything, will it? <laughs> oh, yes, they've got a most absolutely gorgeous home. You can see some of the stuff they've got. <laughs> and, of course, you know, she's had a... They gave her everything, of course. Wonderful education. You know, I'm all in favour of education in moderation. <laughs> Because it can, mums, can't it? They can grow up just a little bit too quickly. They become a little bit too sophisticated and knowing for their ages. <laughs> Heaven above, anyway, amongst many things that we go and we try to do our best, Norm and I. <laughs> can't do any more, can we? <laughs> amongst the many presents we gave them for their wedding was a picture. Well, it was an original, really. You can always tell an original. The eyes follow you all round the room. <laughs> You could see it. It was a lovely thing. It was. I just wish you could see it. It was a picture. 
It was a picture of a colored lass. Wearing a big yellow straw hat. <laughs> oh, beautiful thing, you know. Lovely, unique piece of work, you know. Where is it now? Certainly not hanging on their wall. You know what they've got instead? They've got a picture of a Chinese girl with a green face. <laughs> futuristic stuff me give me a good Van Gogh self-portrait any day <laughs> or the one on the bridge <laughs> still it's their lives isn't it <laughs> suppose <laughs> certainly they have a most beautiful home they built they're out they're out at Campbelltown <laughs> You know the big hill at Campbelltown with a con with a convent of the Good Samaritan right up on the top there? <laughs> There's no doubt about them, is there? <laughs> committee. <laughs> Our object is forgive and forget, live and let live, you know. <laughs> and why not? Life's too short. <laughs> Our object, you see, is to raise monies <laughs> to bring Tokyo Rose to Australia. <laughs> you know is a very very wonderful woman uh, she's in the audience tonight and she will be that cross I'm mentioning her <laughs> <laughs> sorry Madge <laughs> <laughs> sorry dear I'll be in hot water afterwards <laughs> but she is such a wonderful wonderful person <laughs> <laughs> and she's more a human being really <laughs> I met Matt in the old country. As a matter of fact, we were broadened together. <laughs> <laughs> and it was only on the boat coming over that we became so close, really. We shared a cabin and a wash basin. <laughs> we used to rub through our little personals together. <laughs> no better way of getting to know someone, too. <laughs> And you see, we came by New Zealand, the Panamanian way. What a quaint, delightful little spot that is, too. As a matter of fact, Madge had spent her girlhood, and Madge in New Zealand. And I was quite interested in the place. I said to Madge, I said, as a matter of fact, I believe we have this Maori problem there. She said, well, Edna, yes, we have. <laughs> but she said, they've really adapted themselves marvellously well. <laughs> And it really learned to fit into the New Zealand way of life. Isn't that marvellous? <laughs> and she went on to say, she said, as a matter of fact, Edna, she said, I've got a lot of time for the Maoris. <laughs> that gives you an idea of the sort of woman she is. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. If there were more people in the world like Madge also, it would be a very different place. <laughs> 
if some of our leaders and prime ministers were all like Nigel Sop. <laughs> Come to think of it, our prime minister is like Nigel. <laughs> smiling happily. <laughs> what a lovely way to smile, isn't it? <laughs> Oh, look, I think some of those journalists are clever with their choice of words, don't you? <laughs> they ought to be writers. <laughs> but quite seriously, you know, everywhere I went, on my travels, and to whom? <coughs> To whom everyone I spoke. <laughs> <laughs> they all had a word for our Prime Minister. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't always the word I expected, but <laughs> you see, he is so right, ladies, when he says that we here in Australia are in the melting pot. <laughs> We're in the melting pot. Well, you come to think of it, it's really just a question of who's going to melt first. <laughs> and on behalf of Australian womanhood, let me say quite definitely and categorically, <laughs> <laughs> it won't be me! There's the church and there's the steeple, open the doors, <laughs> and there's all the people. It all started just prior to last Easter when Phil and Doffy Prentice sold up their home at 43 Gallipoli Crescent. Between you and me, they got a very nice price. And Phil told me on the quiet they got what they asked. They sold to an exception exceptionally nice young couple with a pair of youngsters too who looked as though they'd take a real interest in the garden. When I first heard the new people were a Clive and Glenda Nettleton it didn't ring a bell but Beryl said to me Nettleton, Nettleton, Nettleton then she remembered that Valda Clissold's younger sister Wanda had married a Brian Hiscock, one of the Hiscock boys, who worked in exactly the same office, so it eventuated, as a Clive Nettleton, who had married an old school friend of Wanda's by the name of Glenda Hibbertson, and who now had a couple of kiddies, boy six, girl eight, Put it another way. When Beryl was in Bethesda having her veins done, she met Valda Clissold, who was in the next bed. They got on like a house on fire, and later on, through young Valda, we met her sister Wanda. And how the amazing part about it was 
that Wanda Hiscock, uh, who was a Wanda Glissold, had been to school with a Glenda Hibbertson, who later on had married a Clive Nettleton, who worked in exactly the same office as her husband. It sounds a bit on the complicated side, I know, but it's not if you think that Valda Clissold, who was in Bethesda with Beryl, has a brother-in-law, Brian Hiscock, a one of the Hiscock boys, who works in exactly the same office as the husband of a sister Wanda's old school friend, Glenda Hibbertson. Isn't it a small world? Naturally, we made ourselves known, and it wasn't very long after that that young Glenda Nettleton was knocking on the back door. A cup of icing sugar, a drop of cochineal, cream of tartar, the odd lemon. I told Beryl to watch it or she'd be letting herself in for a lot of babysitting. And sure enough, before we knew where we were, they were round here for afternoon tea. Plus young Wayne and Marilyn. Oh, but what a bonza pair of youngsters they were, a couple of little trimmers. Clive Nettleton hadn't had a real break from work since the marriage, and she was a bundle of nerves and as thin as a rake. So seeing as they were tantamount to being friends of ours, through the Cliss old girls, Beryl and I had a bit of a confab in the kitchen, and we intimated to them that we were desirous to mind the youngsters for them over the Easter period, while they had a bit of a breather down at her people's home. Well, they hummed and ha. They said they wouldn't dream of it. You don't want a little boy of six and a half and a girl of eight under your feet. I said, don't talk a lot of twaddle. I said, the offer's there. You're a young couple. You might as well take the chance while you can. To tell you the truth, we'd fallen for those kiddies like a ton of bricks. Well, I wouldn't take no for an answer. And Glenda Nettleton could see with half an eye that Beryl was scrupulous. And the tinies would be well catered for at Kyora. On the Thursday before Easter, I got home from the office early to see if there was anything I could do to help Beryl. I brought home a few smarties and jelly beans and licorice all sorts too, but Beryl put a foot down and said I'd spoil their tea. She had everything beautifully under control, and she sent me down the street to get some extra milk if the little man was open. I chased all over the blessed shop, and by the time I got back, Wayne and Marilyn had had their tea and had almost finished their bath. I put my head round the corner to see if I could take over, you know, give the wife a bit of a break. She sent me into the lounge room to warm their gym jams. While I was in there, I had a bit of a hunt through my books for something suitable. The Pictorial Atlas, the first year of war in pictures, the second year of war in pictures, the third year of war in pictures, the fifth year of war in pictures, the fourth year of war in pictures, the illustrated family doctor soldiering on, the great book of humour, the story of the world. 
In pictures, I found a couple of my old Sunday school prizes in the long run, but when Beryl came in to collect their pyjamas, she said they had brought their naughty books with them. I was going through one of my cupboards and I came across a whole album of my old Hawaiian records. <laughs> Thank goodness knows what's happened to the little HMV instrument we used to play them on. Hula Moon, My Honolulu Baby, Ukulele Lady, uh, Lovely Hula Hands, Melodies Beryl and I used to dance to years ago. Amazing, really, the amount of junk you keep. Well, the Sandman came in the long run. We left the light on in the hall, and Beryl and I settled down to watch the instrument. On the Good Friday, I thought I'd take them up to Wattle Park for a play on the swings and seesaws and a picnic lunch. I didn't take the vehicle on account of the Easter toll. We couldn't make a start until late-ish, though, as Public transport on a Good Friday is very rag time. Had to phone up the depot and they put me through to a lass who certainly wasn't born on this side of the world. Beryl had cut some delicious sandwiches. Egg and lettuce. Peanut butter. Marmite and walnut, cheese and apricot jam, and lots of bread and butter and hundreds and thousands and one of her own specialities, a chocolate and banana log. She'd only baked it that morning, and the kiddies were most intrigued. Beryl said if they promised to behave themselves at Wattle Park, they could lick the beaters. We'd packed some of Beryl's homemade ginger beer and a thermos for ourselves, but unfortunately... Beryl forgot to put the greaseproof paper around the cork, appertaining to the calamine lotion bottle we use for the milk, with the resultant consequence that by the time we got off the bus, the milk had soaked right through the sandwiches and halfway up the log. As if that wasn't enough, it ruined the lining of a raffia bag that Beryl had bought at the Opportunity Shop. However, it wasn't altogether wasted, as Beryl said she could use it for the pegs. Not to be deterred, young Wayne and Marilyn were as happy as a couple of sand boys. <laughs> playing round on the swings and seesaws and climbing all over the memorial cannon. However, I, I didn't want to make it too long a day as I was quite anxious to get home and tune in to the Good Friday appeal. Beryl and I always give a little something, but we've never heard ourselves called out. Well, I tried to listen in for a while, but it, oh, it was well nigh impossible. Beryl had battered some hot cross buns, and the kiddies were in their nighties and crying out for the instrument. <laughs> Saturday morning, Wayne and Marilyn were as good as gold, 
playing out there on the back lawn while Beryl kept an eye on them through the kitchen window. I was round the front doing a spot of watering. After that summer we had, the nature strip was on its last legs. No rest for the wicked, I jolly nearly forgot their Easter eggs, but I shot down the street and caught the little man, who told me if I'd left it another five minutes I would have been stiff. The eggs I got weren't exactly identical, but they were the only two procurable. Oh, we had a good old laugh that afternoon too, I can tell you. Beryl had gone through the camphor chest and dug out a lot of old clothes which she'd been meaning to give to the Holy Trinity Jumble Sale, and those kiddies gave us a real concert. <laughs> Young Marilyn's been having ballet lessons at Madame Thelma's Academy at the Cub Hall on Wednesdays and Fridays, and she got up there on her toes and danced like a little fairy. Beryl said to see that kitty made her wish she'd kept up with her own lessons. Oh, not to be deterred, young Wayne was all dressed up like Lord Muck. <laughs> Clopping round in a pair of Beryl's high heel shoes, lipstick all over his chops, bangles and earrings and goodness knows what. He was wearing everything but the kitchen sink and showing off something terrific too, but we had to laugh. You should have seen his face, it was a picture no artist could paint. You can't leave them alone five minutes though. They must have got into the camphor chest and dug out an old lingerie box where Beryl keeps some of her very personal things. Anyway, when we came back into the room, they'd eaten the icing off a bit of our wedding cake that Beryl had treasured for 32 years. What can you say to other people's kiddies? If they'd have been children of mine, it would have been a case of Paddy whack the drumsticks and no bones about it. However, we packed them off to bed. Beryl said if they didn't behave themselves, the Easter Bunny wouldn't be calling. It worked like a charm, and there wasn't another peep out of them after that. There's no doubt about it. Beryl's marvellous with kiddies. Well, the Easter Bunny called next morning, but there was merry hell to pay. Their eggs weren't exactly identical. Different coloured silver paper, one of them didn't like dark chocolate anyway. Before we knew where we were, they were fighting like cat and dog. Young Marilyn turned on the waterworks, and Wayne, who's a real little tease, kept on pulling faces, even though we told him the wind might change. He can't reason with some children. However, they were as right as rain before you can say Jack Robinson, and after they'd had their brekkie, I decided I'd run them across to the Holy Trinity Sunday School so they wouldn't miss out on their coloured stickers. I gave them their collection money and decided I'd wait for them round the corner in the vehicle in Farlap Road. Oh, they got some lungs on them, some of them. I could hear those kiddies singing with the window up. Hear the pennies dropping. Sunday school is over and we Beryl had a leg of lamb waiting for us when we got home and 
Seeing as we got the dinner over and done with early, I decided to risk it and run them down to Half Moon Bay, just there and back to see how far it was. Wasn't the only one with that idea either, so it eventuated the traffic on Marine Parade was terrific, and the kiddies were like a wagon load of monkeys. By the time I'd got there and found a decent posse with a view of the beach, Wayne got one of his blood noses and the car radio packed up. Marilyn kept grizzling and wanting to get out of the car, but I had to draw the line at that. A man doesn't want kiddies carting half the beach through his vehicle and scratching a brand new pair of seat protectors. Besides, I'd had to get out once before, you know, when Wayne wanted to spend a penny. He's really too much of a little man now to go with Beryl and his sister. Of course, they were overtired and overexcited, so we called it a day and I ran them back to Gallipoli Crescent. They only picked at their tea, and by the time we'd packed the little scallywags off to bye-byes, Beryl and I were almost too fagged to enjoy the instrument. I was really just as glad that Clive and Glenda were due back on the Easter Monday to take the youngsters off our hands because, to tell you the truth, Beryl was beginning to look very peaky. And I thought, if this goes on much longer, she'll be a cot case. I really think you've got to be cut out to cope with children. <laughs> Not that Wayne and Marilyn were any trouble. We were tickled to bits to have them round the place, but you can have too much of a good thing and they really eat into your time. One way and another. Everything being equal and to all intents and purposes, Beryl and I lead a pretty full sort of life and goodness only knows how we'd have managed if we'd ever embarked on a family. <laughs> Far too busy, that was our trouble. You've got to have a bit of finance behind you too. You can't feed and clothe the family out of thin air. Decent schooling cost a packet in this day and age, appertaining to that. Alan Chapman tells me some of the fees they're asking and getting are absolutely ridiculous. <coughs> uh, further uh, to that, Beryl isn't a terribly well type of person. There's nothing organically wrong with her. She's never ill. She just isn't a hundred percent. It strikes me if you're going to embark on a family, you have to take all the particular factors appertaining to it into a certain amount of consideration. Look what happens when they grow up. They either wipe their boots on you or they marry the first one that comes along and pack you off to a twilight home. I've seen it happen time and time again. You look at these beatniks and juvenile delinquents, when I look at young Wayne and Marilyn, I can't help thinking it's a pity they have to grow up. Clive and Glenda collected the youngsters in the vicinity of um, seven thirty. We were all in the lounge room viewing the instrument when the door chimes went and they shot to the door like greased lightning. <laughs> young Marilyn was clutching the Easter bunny we'd given her and young Wayne was still wearing a pair of Beryl's high heels, the little Turk. Of course, Clive and Glenda were very appreciative of what we had done, but between you and me, 
I don't think they realize the half of it. Anyway, what with all the farewells and goodbyes, there was that much pandemonia, I forgot to put the tins out. place seems quiet without them, of course, but those few days took a lot out of Beryl and she, well, she got quite weepy when they went. You don't mind doing the neighbourly thing once in a while, but it's nice to get back to your own interests. Can you keep a secret? I don't suppose you can. You mustn't laugh and you mustn't cry. But uh, do the best you can.